Welcome to the Oceania Stata Conference and welcome to our first speaker, Stephen Jenkins. I should say straight, straight away that uh, the paper is co-authored with Fernando Rio Sevilla, who many of you know, uh, he, he's an essential part of this paper and the various papers that we're doing. And you'll hear more from Fernando indirectly from John Denue later on. Um, I, the materials that lie behind this paper are available uh, for download and there are, I'll pass these slides on to David for, for others to look at. They've got references as well. So I'm talking about linked data. Um, what, am, what am I talking about there? So we're talking about where you've got in a household survey reports by respondents on a variable such as earnings, but it doesn't have to be earnings, so it could be some other monetary variable, where they're linked to reports about exactly the same variable in an administrative record data set, for example, personal income tax or social security data. And the important thing is that it's for the same respondents. The idea is to have one source here, another source here, put them together and hopefully match up the right fingers. And these things are important because you've got multiple responses for the same people. And so with these linked data, you can say something about data quality, otherwise known as measurement error. You can say how much bias and spurious variation there are in measures of interest. You can do things like see whether or not those errors are correlated the true with the true or unobserved measure. And that becomes uh, particularly important, for example, in the earnings context where a negative correlation has been interpreted to say that low earners over-report, high earners under-report, otherwise known as mean reversion in measurement errors. And that has a knock-on implication, for example, about whether observed earnings inequality is greater or less than the underlying true inequality. Clearly, uh, we're not the first in this field. There is what I would call a first generation set of studies. There's a whole heap of them associated uh, with names like Bound and Kruger, Bollinger, and so virtually all working with US data. But they, what's distinctive about them is that they assume that in the linked administrative data, the admin data are the truth. There's no error in them. And so it makes things easier because all the measurement errors arise from the difference between the observed survey earnings and what's in the admin data. Well, that's a bit too easy. So we move on to the second generation and there aren't so many studies, uh, we are one of them, which allows for errors in the administrative data as well, as well as screw ups in the data linkage, linkage to those fingers meet. So we're gonna pro provide models for both first and generation second studies. Just to visualize these things a bit, I've got a chart here where on the vertical axis, I've got the logarithm of earnings. I'm an economist, so we're working logs for most of the time. And you can see higher earnings go up the vertical axis. And then I've got dots corresponding to each particular observation. And the height of the observation in the picture tells you how large their earnings are. We've got survey data, green. We've got admin data, orange. We've got the, the true data in the middle, the diamonds. And clearly you've got measurement error, the extent to which the heights on the green end or the orange end differ from what you see in the middle and the truth. And clearly if you, in the first generation studies, you just effectively cut combining the orange and the blue heights, gets rid of uh, quite, a lot of the, quite a lot of the issues. Okay, so that's essentially the, data sources we're working with, where do finite mixture models come into it? The point is that they're really good for both describing the distribution of the true or error-free substantive variable of interest, earnings I'm talking about, as well as the different sorts of measurement errors out there. So as it's a finite mixture model, you've got to talk about latent classes and you've got to talk about the probabilities that somebody belongs to a latent class. Well, in this particular case, as I'm going to show you, that the latent classes are characterized by the different combinations of error-ridden and or error-free survey and administrative data observations. I'll elaborate shortly. The probabilities of latent class membership are then going to depend also on the probabilities that somebody is subject to the different types of error. So that's like any old, any, uh, uh, any old uh, finite membership uh, a mixed finite mixture model. But in the particular case, we've got structure here that is imposed by our assumptions about the nature of measurement error. And that means that uh, state is very fine FMM suite doesn't work here, can't be applied. 
So uh, we've developed our own suite um, for both estimation and post-estimation. All our pro programs are uh, prefaced with uh, KY underscore. KY, as we shall see, stands for Captain Ipna after a very influential model in the literature that we, we replicate and uh, also extend in various ways. So I'm going to come back and talk about the estimation and post-estimation later on. So here we are. Uh, our, our Captain and Ipna, or KY, possibly easier to say, they were, they're important because they were the first to introduce a finite mixture model in this context that allowed for errors in the linked administrative data error. Remember, second generation. But the only sort of error that they allowed in this particular case was linkage error. They didn't allow for measurement error in the uh, admin data. Then along came mates of theirs. Yes, all these people have Dutch names, Maya Rovera and Van Speek. Um, they took the post-estimation part of KY further forward, deriving formally for a number of hybrid earnings predictors that combine the information from both the two sorts of data sources. And they showed that was really cool because you got more reliable measures by combining information. They're, they were more reliable than either the survey separately or the admin data separately. And they illustrate their um, arguments using um, Captain and Eatner's estimates. So these new kids on the block, um, what we did was allow for measurement error in the linked admin data as well as linkage error. We allow for, we do all the post prediction stuff like MRW. And thirdly, we allow covariates to appear everywhere. So I, and that's in our substantive application, that's important. Okay, so let's now talk about how um, the latent classes can arise. And that arises because people can have different sorts of administrative earnings, different types of survey earnings, depending on what sort of error or lack of error they have. So for the admin earnings, we're, we're suggesting that those are a mixture of three different types. So first of all, an observation may be correctly linked with a probability pi r, or they could be mismatched, there's a screw up. And then amongst the correctly linked cases, they may be either error-free with some probability uh, pi nu, or they may contain uh, measurement error. So what that leads through to is three types of observation. The cool one is, of course, when you've got no measurement error. So what we call uh, register, uh, R for register, as in the original article. So admin earnings is, is that person's earnings are equal to true earnings, the CI, for that person. Secondly, that per um, somebody may have mean reverting measurement error, or there is, they're mismatched, in which case, basically, their earnings that you show up in the linked data set are the earnings of somebody else in the, in the full administrative data set. And we call those uh, earnings zeta i. So what that means is that we have three types of observation, R1, R2, R3, and they have different probabilities that relate to the structural probabilities of the different sorts of error. And here we have in the first for R1, here's where they're equal to the truth. Their earnings, observed earnings in the admin data are equal to the truth. Here we have mean reverting uh, measurement error with the possibility of an additional error, which KY called contamination. Or indeed, in the mismatch case, you've got to screw up. You've got earnings that come from elsewhere in the admin data. In the survey earnings, uh, we've got three types of observation as well. Once again, it may well be that obser observations have got error-free earnings, or alternatively, the survey measurement error. Uh, and uh, or th thirdly, it also have error plus contamination. So that leads us to these three cases again. And we have, for example, that probability that, that somebody's reporting the, the true underlying earnings unobserved with probability pi s, and then the chances of different sorts of measurement error. So for example, down here, we end up with these three classes, S1, S2, S3. These are the equations, the factors making up their different earnings and the probabilities of occurrence. So what we then have got, that means in the linked data set, when we put together admin earnings and survey earnings. We've got three types in the survey of earnings, three types in the admin data, three times three equals nine. 
So we have nine different latent classes depending on the possible combinations of the different types. So we have latent class probabilities, nine of them, pi one through pi nine. And so for example, group one contains the observations with the combination R1S1, and that probability pi one is the product of those probabilities shown on the screen, pi r, pi nu, pi s. Group two contains observations with the combination R1 and S2. So truth in the admin data, uh, measurement error in the survey, and so on and so on for, for all of the nine uh, different classes. You can see the paper for the full list. And so to complete the model, what you have to do is make assumptions about the shape of the earnings distributions. Okay, so that's what I, we call F, uh, the density functions for those, for each of the different classes. And we're going to assume in our paper that each of those, the different factors, are each normally distributed. So true earnings, for example, um, which are actually true log earnings, I'm just leaving out the log to make it easier. Uh, so essentially we're saying that earnings are log normally distributed and similarly the other earnings factors and so on. And in our model, if you see the paper, we have true earnings and contamination areas being bivariate normal. Why normality? Because it helps us a lot, folks, the usual reasons, both to fit the models by maximum likelihood and because it helps us with our post-estimation derivations. So our equations are more complicated than other people have had before. The other thing I said we did was to allow the distributions to vary with observed characteristics. So essentially what we do is allow model parameters the things that summarize these distributions, because they're normal, they're characterized by means, standard deviations, there are also uh, rever mean reversion parameters, correlations, and so on. Essentially, we can allow those, or a transformation of those parameters, to be a, a linear function of characteristics, a standard index function approach. And it's also great for estimation. And then in the post-estimation uh, stage, we uh, do a, a reverse transformation. So we get a familiar looking likelihood function in general, uh, the log of the likelihood of the whole sample, sum over the individuals of the log of the sum over the nine latent classes, where for each of the, the elements, we have the probability of being in a given latent class times the density, which depends on the two types of earnings. However, however, and this was KY's important insight, uh, for class one, we, the survey and the administrative earnings are equal. So given the model assumptions, that means that the distribution uh, degenerates to a univariate normal. This is the case if they're observed equal, we're essentially saying that both of them are equal to true earnings. So what we've done in that particular case, immediately we've identified in one part of the model, the mean and the variance of, of true earnings. Moreover, class membership is actually known. It's not unobserved for these for this particular group. So class one, really important. In the literature, this is known as the completely labeled group. The next uh, equation down here is then what the likelihood becomes when you make the simplification, uh, drawing on the simplification. And then basically you, you maximize that likelihood um, to derive the parameters. Uh, Usual standard question for a finite mixture model is, is it identified? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, but skeptical economists would just say, yeah, it's functional form. Yeah, it is folks, uh, though in its normality everywhere, uh, but it's conditional normality. There is so there's some relaxation of that. And by the way, you buy quite a lot of identification for the assumptions that you make up here about how many observations there are in class one. That is, as KY suggested, you don't actually have to have R and S exactly equal to each other. You can loosen the boundary a bit and say effectively, class one is defined by where the observations are close together. And you can look at what happens if you define close together in different ways. And Fernando and I have papers on that. Another important thing in terms of the structure of the model is that the latent class possibility, class possibilities, the pi j, actually depend on three underlying parameters. So you're not out, out there looking for nine of them. Okay, that's the background model. What about stata here? So what we, our general purpose KY fit program does the estimation. It does it for that general model, and, um, 
we've in fact got eight different models. Uh, the general one is number uh, number eight. And we've got a load of special cases going, including the KY one, which is our model four, going back to really basic ones, which is uh, where there's no error at all in the, in the admin data. Standard sort of or familiar looking stator syntax. We have a verb at the front. We have the variables in your data set, which uh, summarize the, what, what you get from the register, what you get from the survey. We have standard stuff like if and in, we allow weights. You choose your model using this. Uh, you have maximization options. One of the things we build in is optionally this um, C1 variable, which is referring to the first latent class. So the standard way in which we've been using this is to define a binary, set up a binary variable in your data that identifies the observations in class one. So you decide how close R and S have to be to be in class one. And we've set up different ways of doing it. Standard way of doing it, for example, is to look at the absolute difference between these two things and then set some critical threshold value. Choose the model value. Yeah, maximization options, uh, make functions, uh, uh, parameters, functions of uh, covariates and so on. So you essentially have stuff very long commands, depending on how many, which model you're looking at and how many covariates you've got. Post-estimation. Uh, you, you could use these to get summary statistics for model parameters, uh, as well as assessing the MRW measures. So we've got an ESTAT command for looking at deriving all the various probabilities. Uh, so, so the summary statistics for latent class probabilities. We've got reliability st statistics of the sort, sort that MRW were talking about. In particular, the, the, the most familiar one is probably the psychometric one, which is the squared correlation between true and observed. And you can, of course, observed can be either survey or admin data. We get reliability statistics with XIREL, MRW ones, the seven different measures I seem to recall. And some of this stuff you have, it's best to do with simulation. 50 reps is the default. We've been working with a thousand sometime. It all works. The other things you're interested in is predictions uh, for which we use the underlying engine is K underscore, KY underscore P. For some reason, we don't see the underscore. So basically with predict and margins, you can get all the distribution parameters, the latent class moments, class probabilities. Uh, with predict, you can get posterior class probabilities, Bayesian classifications of observations into different uh, groups and so on. Uh, and there's, you can get the MRW type measures and so on. Finally, uh, the third program is KY underscore SIM, which is ours used to simulate linked data uh, from these sorts of models. You can do this either way, by just by feeding the KY SIM user provided parameters, and they might be those from previously fitted models from somewhere. And that's useful for analyzing data property, properties, creation of synthetic data, testing your knowledge of com various commands and so on. Um, and you, first of all, you can just use KY sim by throwing in parameters, no cover covariates, or you can actually simulate um, data from parameters of model previously uh, fitted that have been stored in memory uh, using s or s um, type stuff. You just call it in and there can be covariates there. Right, I'm in, in my last five minutes, um, what, what I'm gonna do is give you an illustration of our model um, and how it works uh, applying to the KY case. Basically, I'm gonna reproduce what's in their paper. So first of all, we're gonna simulate from their, their reported estimates, refit their model and various uh, more basic ones and then derive the predictions. So in their model four, remember admin data could be mismatched. There could be measurement error in the uh, survey data with mean reversion and contamination and possibly linkage error. And in their model, which was based on sw Swedish data, they found uh, around 4% linkage error, but no significant mean reversion error in, in survey earnings. And this is a really important finding because all the generation one studies find substantial mean reversion. It goes away once you allow for admin data errors. Okay, so I won't go through the gory details here, but you can just see we're setting up various globals. These parameters 
are ones that are taken from the KY paper. And then we just feed them into KY Sim, 400 observations, because they had 400 observations, model four, because it's theirs, we have to set the seed, we're simulating after all, and here's all the parameters. And we're going to store our estimates in, for, in model zero. Okay, so we run the simulation, we get the data out, and these variables down here correspond to our underlying factors, true and so on, contamination uh, and so on. The structural probabilities, probability of uh, survey error and so on, probability of contamination mismatch, uh, observed variables, and down here, um, classes. You can see there are in, in the KY model, there are five classes rather than nine. Okay, can you keep in mind, so the true earnings are about, uh, the true log earnings, the mean is about 12.3. And this is what you look like if you were to plot admin earnings against survey earnings. So basically you can see that uh, as in their original data, most of the observations appear to lie on or close to the 45 degree line, but boy, there are some that are way off. And that we being out here in different places on this diagram, corresponding to membership of different latent classes. And you can show that and you can look at our papers and, and their papers to, for that. Okay, what you can then do is fit all the variants of the models that they talked about in their paper, models one, two, three, four. And that's just uh, almost exactly the same uh, syntax in each case, but you can see that we've just changed uh, the, the model number and to get the very, really basic model they assume we just have a constraint as well. Um, and then uh, what we get here is the key parameters from the KY model down the left-hand side. I won't go through the gory details, but here are the estimates from the KY model and one can find uh, the, 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 the estimates that are reported here in this table here are, are remarkably close to the, what reported by their uh, article. Okay, so that, that's neat and I've, that's proof positive that we're doing something right. Now you can do neat things like, uh, well, you know, you don't want to look at um, variances in a log metric. You want to look at variances or standard deviations and so on and so on. So what we can do is use margins, predict, for example, predict means, predict standard deviations of, of these and out pops these things back in their original metric. Um, a the, the ones down at the very bottom, for example, are correlations and so on. You can easily extend this in the case where you've got observed parameters. Margins can be used to derive marginal mean estimates of the parameters. So for example, you suppose that survey measurement error differs between men and women. Men and women's status is summarized in a bi bi binary variable called sex. So we specify the log of the error variance, uh, error standard deviation as a function of sex. And then after estimation, you just type margins, sex, comma, predict. Uh, whoops, I put mean there. I should have logs of the, so typo there. You'll get the mean if you do that, but you can do exactly the same for lon sog, uh, sig v. Sorry about that typo. Okay, final thing I think I'm gonna show you is um, the MRW uh, predictions. Uh, there are seven different ones. The key thing to take away from this is the, the fact that we pr can produce them. You look in MRW's paper and our replication in the Journal of Applied Econometrics, the numbers are exactly the same as theirs. Just to have, by the way, the bottom line in terms of substantive terms is that the reliability squared correlation coefficients of the observed earnings, note that for the admin earnings, it's just less than 0.5 around 0.75 for the survey earnings. And then, but the re reliability of these estimators, hybrid estimators, when you pull the information from the two different sources is hugely higher. And that also shows up in the mean squared areas. Okay, to finish then, uh, what I've shown you is a new set of commands for estimation and post estimation of finite mixture models in a rather uh, specialist context. Uh, I've talked about earnings, but it can be applied to other variables. Um, if you want to look at more, have a look at our um, big IZA working paper where we extend things. I've told you that this, we do loads of stuff. Uh, and if 
just say our stuff is being used not just by us, but apparently some others are currently looking at US and Austrian data using our programs. So thanks very much. I'd be very pleased to answer any questions or comments. So if you raise your Zoom hand, I think I can see it. Stephen, thank you for that. We've, we've got a couple of questions in the chat already. Okay, so we've got John. one from John Deneu and also one from Austin Nichols. Uh, yeah, John um, says, this sounds great for large panel data sets that has access to admin data. Does understanding society have access to admin data on earnings? No, is the short answer. Um, and uh, the, the issue is where you would get it from. Uh, we had um, confidential one-off uh, access to department work, work and pensions, very special file uh, and confidence. So that, you know, that we're, we're in di to difficult ter territory here with um, access to these data sets. The other important thing that you said there is panel data sets. Our models that we've been talking about are for uh, cross-sectional data sets. With panel data sets, as, as usual, you can do more, but you would probably want to extend our models in a way to take, for, for example, suppose somebody is prone to measurement error like in the survey or in the admin data, you might think there might be some persistence over time in that measurement error, and you want to model that somehow. We haven't done that, and we didn't do it because we didn't have the data. I would love her access to the data and for us to be able to play around with that. Uh, okay, John, I hope i uh, move on to Austin. Um, who asks what's the barrier to extending a non-normal family of multivariate distributions? Um, fast evaluate is is it is the are the barriers evaluation for simulation and numerical integration? Uh, probably standard stuff about um, when you go beyond univariate distributions into bivariate and multivariate distributions, having having anything that's feasible is really hard to, to make work. Um, so that's the short answer. I, I guess the short answer, Austin, is yes. Uh, Kim Huan asks, would you give us some advice about how class one is often decided or chosen and the impact of this on, um, on the estimation of the other classes? Yeah, really important question. And in fact, this was one of the reasons I got in, interested in this, um, basically, you just have to choose a number. And by default, that number could be zero in the sense you may require strictly that um, it is uh, observed earnings and survey earnings have to be exactly equal. But frankly, that that's being a bit tough. If you think about uh, you know, how many decimal places uh, you think earnings are likely to be well recorded and then put that in logs and so on. So, that leads me to the second question, which is the impact of this error on the estimation of the other classes. So the way in which we've attacked this is um, essentially to try a range of different assumptions. In our particular case, it was plausible to have around three or 4% uh, maximum for in this class. In our economics letters uh, paper, we, we went the whole gamut from near zero up to 15% and addressed exactly the question that you were talking about. And for, interestingly, um, a lot of things were very robust, uh, which is reassuring, I guess. Simon, uh, very practical question in putting the code together. How long did it take together to put it in, in this stage? Okay, well, Simon, there's you, there's me, and there's Fernando. Fernando is a really cool state of programmer. Um, but it took him a while too. And I'm the nagging guy at the other end who says, why did you do that? And, and running it and finding all the errors. It's really hard to say, I, I don't know. And it was a cumulative thing where we were starting with, as you do normally, start to walk before you try and run. So we were starting with the, the basic models going up to model four and I'd say, let's push it in this direction. And we finally got up to model eight. Um, and that took about a year, but was it, that wasn't just coding time. There was a lot of playing, so to speak, uh, trying things out, what's plausible. And we've got some extensions that I didn't tell you about here. But, um... Okay, Michael, uh, how did you get this? How do we get the data? The answer is, uh, 
yeah, very special um, access. In the survey data, the people had to give their consent to record linkage. I mean, they give that routinely um, in the uh, in the family resources survey that we were using in our in our own application. The Department for Work and Pensions uh, then linked. And they had a special um, project. They're really interested in administrative data at the moment, or back in 2012 when when they did, did this exercise, and they linked those data to. HMRC, the tax office um, returns for that employers make about social insurance contributions, national insurance contributions in the UK. So basically we had to sign our lives away. Um, we can only, I'm the only person who can access these da data, Fernando can't, we can't take data out uh, and so on and so on. So there are very, very big constraints. Uh, and as Austin's put more in the chat, um, about uh, the conditions for this. But in the US, there are more possibilities um, that mean you can do things, but it basically means send, sending people in, inside secure data centers. 